Amen. I'm so grateful to be here again today, you guys. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, if I could speak probably on behalf of myself and probably a lot of people in here, if I had to say one thing that I was thankful for, I am thankful for having a pastor, Pastor Matt, that has been teaching us the practical word from the Bible. Amen. 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 In his absence, uh, he's taken some well-needed time with his family uh, to be able to absorb the moment and just be normal for a minute, if you will. So I'm grateful that he's been able to do that. And I'm honored that he would choose me to be before you guys today. I want to say a quick prayer for myself because my prayer is that God will contain me, that God will slow my thoughts down, that God will allow me to focus on the word that he's given me for you today. I also want to uh, add to uh, the cause that we're getting ready for, that we will get our minds ready and our hearts ready for the homeless outreach on Saturday, December the 21st. It's open to anybody that wants to come out and serve and be a part of a moment that plays uh, uh, an int uh, intricate role in the changing of lives as it pertains to the homeless. Now let's get to it. The gifts of Christmas. The gifts of Christmas, hope, love, joy, and peace. The gift of hope is what we're going to focus in here today. I want to focus on it so much I wore a shirt so that it could stay in your eyes while I'm preaching. The gift of hope. Today I invite you to hear and embody the word hope. As we enter the season of Advent, which means the coming or the arrival of while we eagerly await Christmas. My hope is that through God's word, it will give us the understanding we need and dispel the feeling of emptiness we get sometimes. God has given us a sense of being where hope should be exercised. It is the very thing that assists us in looking forward in life while dispelling the feeling of being stuck like Chuck. This will soon make sense to you as we continue forward. I want to start by telling a story of a, a, a popular cartoon that I grew up on and I love. There's a cartoon by the name of Charlie Brown Christmas that has been airing since 1965, created by Mr. Charles Schultz. But first I wanna give thanks to my pastor, Pastor Matt, um, that gave me the backstory insight to this cartoon that I grew up on. The backstory is that this cartoon episode for Charlie Brown Christmas was a last minute production that came about when Coca-Cola came looking for a Christmas special to sponsor holiday marketing. To make this long story short, Mr. Schultz insisted that in order for this story to be told, the true Christmas story, it had to be told with a scene read straight from the Bible. It starts with Charlie Brown and Lionel walking through the snow. Charlie Brown begins to tell Linus his feelings about Christmas. Charlie says, like receiving gifts, Charlie says, excuse me, that he likes receiving gifts and all of that. But for some reason, I still feel sad and depressed afterwards. I don't know what's wrong, Charlie says. Along the way, walking through the snow, Charlie Brown approaches a makeshift booth in the snow with a sign on it, on the front of it that says, doctor is out. Lucy then walks into the booth and flips the sign around 
to open. She then asks Charlie, what seems to be your trouble? Charlie shares, I feel depressed. I should be happy, but I'm not. She tries to label Charlie Brown's symptoms. In the end, Lucy says, you need involvement. So she invites Charlie to be their Christmas play director. Oh boy, Charlie is excited. Everything, to fast forward, everything Charlie Brown did for the play goes wrong. So Lucy and the guys suggested that Charlie go back or go to pick out an aluminum tree for the play because everybody likes them, she says. Charlie picks out a miniature live tree with thistles falling off with every move. But Charlie sees hope in the tree and says, it needs love too. Oh boy, they go in on Charlie. They complain. It doesn't fit the modern spirit. You can't tell a good tree from a poor tree, they says to Charlie. Everything Charlie Brown does goes wrong. For some reason, I I, I remember looking at this cartoon as a child, and I don't remember how strong their words were until now. I'm reading as an adult. So in exasperation, he cries out, isn't there anyone that knows what Christmas is all about? Linus steps forward and recites Luke 2 and verses 8 through 14. And he says, and there's a shepherd, there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring to you news that will cause great joy. Back one. I will bring to you good news. Back. (laughs) Go back to 10. Yes, I will bring to you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with an angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. In those words, Charlie Brown finds hope. It is said that there is, there is where the whole Christmas experience for him turns for him and good old Chuck realizes the true meaning of Christmas. But let's tarry over Luke uh, 2 and verse 8 for a moment, 8 through 14 for a moment, as we look closer to the intentional past, present, and future of the Lord. You can see Um, the intention of the Lord, if you actually go back to Luke in verses 2 and 1 through 5. In Luke verses 2 and 1 through 5 is where God sets the stage for all of this to happen, where Mary will accept her position in having the child and and where uh, Joseph and Mary will proceed to go to this place the city of David, where they are actually going there to sign up for the census that was put in place for the very first time back in Luke 2 and verses 1 through 5, where the census was put in place, which caused Joseph to go to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David, 
which lines up with verses 11. Now I want to speak to the humility of the scripture as it pertains to Luke verses 2 and 8 through 14. Humility is the essence of Jesus' birth from being born in a manger, which is, pleasing, which is a pleasing way of saying a trough or a feed, which is for an animal, because there were no rooms available in the inn. In verse 10, angels bringing good news that will cause a great joy for all the people. The angels will bring good news and it will cause great joy for all the people. Now, we're talking about the past, the present, and the future of hope in these scriptures. In the past, this whole setting is built around the Israelites that are waiting on this Messiah to come free them from their conditions. Israel is hoping and waiting for the Messiah to be born in a manger that would save them. Isaiah 7 and 14 is the reference scripture I have here where it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. In the present, he is born and crucified on the cross for our salvation. A present hope in Jesus, a present hope in Jesus doesn't stop the storms that we have here today. Hebrews 6 and verse 19 supports that. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. The future of hope. Now concerning how um, we digest this, in verse Thessalonians 5 and verses 1 and 2, it's talking about the second coming of Christ. And now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. We should be living with an expectation of his return. There's a lot to be said in these scriptures. And I'm thankful that God would choose this moment and, and uh, give me a situation because I'm one of them type people. I need things to be put in my way to cause me to dig deeper into the word of God to really understand the depth of what he's saying. And when you read back in the scripture here uh, in Luke verses 2 and 8 through 14, even when it talks about the night where there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. He could have appeared to anybody else. He could appear to the kings. He could appear to whoever was in a higher court. But some reason, for some reason, this part here reminds me of even how uh, they chose David. David was a shepherd boy in the background. But here, they're just the same. The angels appeared to the Lord among them. And it says that the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. This baby that was born, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. I've read this scripture a whole lot of times, you guys, in my life. I've been saved since 1996, and even in this study period, I learned things that I had never saw before, and I heard it over and over, but I couldn't digest it. The baby, the Messiah, the Lord, 
This baby that we're talking about, Jesus, is all of these. He is Lord. He is Messiah. He is our Savior. I'm going to say it again. He is Lord. He is Messiah. He is our Savior. He is the one that passed the Israelites and others were waiting on him. But he is also the one today that a lot of us are still waiting on him. Why are we waiting on him? We're waiting on him because some of us have yet to respond to the tickling of the ear. Where when he speaks to us and he's calling us unto him, he's just waiting on us to respond. He's waiting on us to hear his voice and harden not our hearts. The Savior, the Messiah, Lord. Lying in a manger and suddenly... The angel was joined by a vast of hosts of others. The armies heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Who are the people that he's talking about that God is pleased with? I come to understand that the ones that God is pleased with are the very ones that did not harden their heart. They accepted who Jesus was. They accepted who the Messiah is. They accept who the Lord is. These are the ones that God is speaking of that he is pleased with. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to hear your voice back in 1996. I want to speak now. We talked about the past, the present, and the future of, of, Christ, of, the, of, the, of hope. Excuse me. We talked about the baby being the Messiah, being Lord, and being God himself. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's a phrase that's inspired by the scripture in Matthew verses 7 and verses 25 where it speaks of the same rock, the same Messiah, and the same Lord and the same Savior, born in a manger, giving us that hope of past and that hope of present and that hope of the future. In Luke verses 15 and 10, in the same way, there's a joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. I am so thankful for who God is. I'm so thankful for his son. I am so thankful that he would give us ears to hear what he's calling us to here today. As I read from Luke verses 15 and 10 again, I want to read it again. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels. When one sinner repents. So I understand from these scriptures that there's a lot that took place in the past. You have the Israelites that were waiting on the Messiah. In the present, you have where Jesus was born in this manger in Bethlehem. And then crucified, which if he wasn't crucified, we wouldn't have a savior here today. And in the future, this same Christ, as we approach Christmas, it's the present that we live for every December the 25th, where we're waiting on Christmas Day to get here to celebrate his birth, 
to celebrate a savior, to celebrate the Messiah, to celebrate the Lord. In the future, we have an expectation that supersedes even that. He came once, but in future, he's going to come again. And when he comes again, guess who he's coming for? He's coming for those that he calls his own. He's coming for those that he loves. He's coming for those that have not hardened their heart. He's coming for those that know and admit it that they are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of the Lord. He's coming for those that want a new beginning. He's coming for those that desire to have their minds transformed by the renewing of his spirit. He's coming for those that want nothing but Jesus. He's coming for those that love him. He's coming. Do you believe he's coming? I heard five. Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Yes. Let me give you this. If you're not sure if you believe that he's coming, I challenge you to get in his word because his word doesn't lie. I know it's hard to fathom sometimes. I found it hard to fathom even in my earlier walk when I start hearing these things about who he was. How could he be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? I couldn't fathom these things. But it came to a point in my life where things that I dealt with in my life, I, 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 I couldn't deal with it on my own. I remember hitting a, sp a, a spot in my life where I'm driving and it's a summer day in Atlanta, Georgia. My sunroof is open. I'm riding in a nice ride and I can't feel the sun. I can't feel the air blowing. I couldn't feel a thing, but it was one of the most beautiful days during the summer. Why couldn't I feel anything? I couldn't feel anything, I realized, because I had become disconnected with the source, the very source that gives us our being. I was on the verge of losing my hope. That hope is the thing that causes you to be able to feel and experience and to be able to expect future things to come. This hope is a lifeline. And it's not just for one person. He made it available for all of us. He, do not, he does not discriminate who this is for. All we have to do is receive it. But on that day in Atlanta, I couldn't feel the sun. I couldn't feel the air. I couldn't feel anything. I had lost my job. I had lost my apartment. I didn't know what else to do. I remembered feeling so low that I had packed everything I could into that car, busting through the sunroof. <laughs> and I started to make my way home to Columbus, Georgia. I'm making my way home to Columbus, Georgia. And this is a moment in my life where I don't know what's going on. I'm feeling like Charlie Brown right now. I don't know what's happening to me. I remember saying, God, what's going on with me? Everything is crumbling. Everything is falling. I can't keep anything right. And I'm a grown man trying to survive. And I can't do it on my own. I remember 
just this emptiness inside of me. This same thing we're talking about right here. Where I'm empty. I can't feel what I'm supposed to feel. So the negative response to it is feeling hopeless. What do you do when you reach this place of feeling hopeless? And at this point in my life, guess what? I'm not even a Christian. I'm not even saved. I don't know this Christ that we're talking about. I don't know. What do you do? What I did? I just cried out to the Lord. I cried out to the Lord to do better. I cried out to the Lord to give me what I needed to be a better person. Give me what I need to sustain and to be able to keep what it is God desires for me to have. Now, the conversion still didn't take place then. It was, I don't know, maybe a year or so later before the total conversion took place. But the process had started at my lowest point, which brings me back to this Christ we're talking about. The humility of what God did in Christ, bringing him to the lowest of places to have this child. He didn't have to do that. But I realize now that he did that so that he could reach us. So that he could get our attention. We've had babies. I have children of my own. If you haven't had, you've probably related to someone and have been a part of somebody that has had a baby. We have the best of the world now where we're able to go and prepare the room, get the walls nice, paint them nice, put nice blankets in the room. All of this good stuff we have provisions to now. But God chose to have this child in a manger in the city of David in Bethlehem. How humble is that? How low is that? God, we thank you for your humility. We thank you for your intention. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for being our Lord. Forgive me. I said in the beginning that I needed to be contained because I know how real this God is. I have embraced his very being. I know that he is Lord. I know that he is the Messiah. I know that he saved me. I know that he is the reason for our being. I am so grateful because he could have chosen another route for me. He could have chosen another route for you. But he didn't. The intention of God, the providence of God, prepared in the past that allowed you to be here in the future. The providence of God, the intention of God, makes a way out of no way. 
the intention of God, the providence of God sets things up. All the time. The job you got now was prepared for you before you got it. The children that were made were made before you before you received them. He says that we were formed from the foundations of the earth. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? The intention of God, the providence of God is pure, is exact, is profound, is prolific. The intention of God, the providence of God is waiting on the one that desires to be saved. If this is the day that the Lord has made for you, hear his voice and harden not your heart. Hear his voice and turn from your wicked ways. Hear his voice and know that he is the Lord. He is Messiah. He is your Savior. The intention of God and the providence of God is the reason for our past hope, our present hope, and our future hope. As we wait on December 25 to celebrate the birth of Jesus, let us not be exasperated as Charlie Brown was, but let us celebrate the goodness of the Lord. He is the reason for the season. Let it heighten even the gifts that you give to each other. To know that if it wasn't for his provisions, we wouldn't be able to do that. But take a moment, maybe even take a gift and take it to someone that needs hope that needs that thing restored up in their bones, that needs their hearts revitalized. That's the slogan of our church, revive and restore. Revive and restore. <laughs> revive and restore hope to someone that's in need of the Lord, of God, of the Messiah. I read to you earlier, Luke 15 and 10, and in closing, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angel. When even one sinner just one repents and Romans 10 and 13 for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord for everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this moment here today, Lord. 
I pray, Father, that I did some service to your name. I pray, Father, that your spirit will go forth in this place, Lord. And if there is one that desires to know you, if there is one that hears your voice, Lord, it is you, Father, that does the calling. We can't call ourselves. All we have to do is call on the name of Jesus. But Father, inhabit the praises of your people here today, Lord. I know that you're in this place here today, Father. Draw upon the hearts of those that desire to know you better. If there is one that desires to know this Jesus, this Messiah, this Lord, feel free to come forward. I'll be standing at the altar here. I'll be glad to pray with you and welcome you into the kingdom of God.